want. If you missed an outline, lift your hand. These guys have one for you. And Chris Corrales has pens. Who needs a pen? If you need a pen, lift your hand, and Chris will give you a pen. So um, tonight we are going to continue in our study. And we're going to take a couple of weeks on this um, as we go tonight. Um, I just commend you for being here tonight as we as we come to Secret Church and study it. For those of you who have maybe joined us midstream, um, Secret Church gets its name from this, that around the world, many people cannot meet in freedom, and so they meet in hiding. And when they meet, their time is precious, so they go fast, and they go with a lot very often, especially when they have a special teacher come in, special teacher comes in and just really unloads on them, and they're hungry to hear it. Maybe for many of them, they've traveled a long way. And, um, and so their time is just limited. And so tonight, we recognize that um, the busyness of our lives um, is kind of like living in a place um, that's just kind of crazy. And we need to set aside time for really clear thinking and strong teaching. And so that's what we do with Secret Church, where we come together and remember that. I want to encourage you to remember um, people like Mark and Kathy Cassay, who are members of our church that live in the Middle East. Um, live in one of the most closed countries of the world. Um, can't mention which name it is, but Mark and Kathy are seeking to win people to Christ and lead other people to Christ in that place. And uh, I just encourage you to remember them even on nights like tonight. So we've been studying cults and counterfeit gospels. And uh, many of you have a notebook. If you don't have a notebook, you can get one um, that, are, that are there. And as we do more secret churches, um, you can add to that and be able to go back. There's many things that we've covered that many of you have said, this is kind of a life-changing truth. I'm going to want to be able to go back to that. You can go back and see the arguments that we make. You can see how God's word um, makes it very, very clear. And so that's the reason we do notebooks. That's the reason we do outlines. But let's, let's blow through the review just a little bit. Week one was the one true gospel. And what we said about the one true gospel is this. It's the character of God, the fact that he is holy and just. It's the sinfulness of man, the fact that we are depraved and without hope. It's the f- sufficiency of Christ. He is the perfect sacrifice. The necessity of faith, you just can't you just can't know those things and intellectually send to them. We have to believe and trust in those things. That has to become our hope, and that's how we come. And the fact of the urgency of the gospel, the urgency of eternity is around us, and people are either going to go to heaven or to hell, and this is the reason we need to be Christians that shine the light of Christ. Jesus said, don't hide the light. He says, shine the light brightly, and that's by the way we live and what we say and the fact that we've been told to go and proclaim the gospel because eternity is at stake. So, and as part of this, we also, if we're going to study the falsehoods, we need to know the true. And so the true God is this. Let's read these out loud together. Number, number one is? It was very weak. Let's try it again. Number one is? Each person is? And there is? Okay, this is, this is the Trinity. Each one of those persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, is um, a person within himself as part of uh, a distinct personhood. But each one is also fully, fully God, and those three are indeed the one true God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God. The Lord is one. And so we, we see this. Then the week three, we looked at identifying the cults in the counterfeit gospels, and that is where we're going to, because we're switching gears tonight a little bit, I want to review for just a second what we said about this. There were two passages of scripture, and I would like for somebody to read that. Evan, would you mind reading that real loud for us? This is 2 John verse 7, or 2 John verse 7. Read that real good. This is a very important passage because it is saying that these deceivers have gone out and they're denying the claims of the gospel. They're denying who Jesus is. They're denying fundamentals of the truth. And that is exactly what we're going to see tonight as we look at theological liberalism. There's another passage that we want to see, Jude 3 and 4. And um, I'd like to, Bernita, do you mind reading that real loud for us? Read, Ber- read, read Bernita 3 and 4. I mean, Bernita, read Jude 3 and 4. Remember, this is from Jude, so read 3 and 4. 
So these verses are critical to what we're going to see tonight. And uh, let's go on and let's look at some of the other things that we've studied. We talked about this. A heresy is a deviation from the church's historical teaching on foundational biblical doctrines. So the foundational biblical doctrines is where we get our, our, our truth from. And from that, we make statements out of the fundamental biblical doctrine. Now, on top of that, people come along and they start to deny some of those statements. And they start to look at it. So ultimately, heretical teaching presents another God or another gospel. And um, so that's what we see happening in each one of these as we go. Let's keep going here. And uh, I want you to see, we looked at Mormonism, and then we looked at Jehovah's Witnesses, then we looked at Catholicism. Um, in Catholicism, we see the, the things of uh, very great religiosity, things that are very close to the truth, but a lot of pomp and circumstance, a lot of grandeur, and ultimately, again, the teaching coming back to one individual, and that ultimately is the picture when we even see the Pope or when we see Joseph Smith or when we see various other leaders of things that divert from the gospel. Well, tonight, or excuse me, uh, uh, not tonight, but it says tonight, but before we looked at, we spent three weeks on prosperity gospel. And we looked at the personalities of the prosperity gospel, but we also looked at much of the heretical teaching of saying that God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. What did we actually say? That healthy and wealthy is always God's will or is holy and devoted God's will? God's will is for us to be holy to him. God's will is for us to be faithful to him. So let's get it off of those crazy, excuse me, let's get it off of those people and let's, let's, let's just remember that the grand picture, and you can go back and you can study and you can go back and look and see where we were, that the gospel is not to be distorted appealing to our own desires, but is, it is to be proclaimed faithfully causing us to look to God as he intends. Well, tonight we come to theological liberalism and... Um, I have a few pictures here that I think some of them, I guess I pray in a way that they're disturbing to you. Theological liberalism um, is a movement that has come and gone, um, in fact, through the millennia um, from, from the beginning of the church um, to the present. There have been waves of this in different ways. Um, we know that the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s renewed the truth in a very powerful way. But you just go two generations later and you start to see many of those truths being, being forgotten or doubted even by children of those Protestant reformers. And then we see a little bit more time go forward. And as we, as we move forward, we see that there's a revival of truth and there's some revivals there. But as Darwinianism and as the Enlightenment gives way to the Industrial Age and the Scientific Age, we begin to see a great doubt upon the basic truths of the Bible. And as a result of that, through philosophy and theology, eventually, at first, in the echelons of academia, those things begin, the, the truth of Scripture begins to be doubted, and eventually that makes its way into the academic circles, teaching pastors and teaching training and leaders, and eventually those divergent gospels and doctrines that are being taught would make it into the church. So as a period of time goes by, we start to see something that has picked up speed in recent days. In recent decades, the last couple of decades, both in Europe and in the United States, we have seen age-old strong denominations that at one time had the gospel begin to leave the gospel. And we see something strange happening that as they leave the gospel, there's, there's no reason to come. As we begin to leave the truths of the gospel, and back up here a little bit, some of these are city churches and some of these... Our, our country churches, as you even see in a couple of these. And then, and then go on and, and, you know, from even not just country churches, but also churches that, that would be, um, back up a little bit, I think you, you uh, uh, there's a couple of here. Uh, 
Okay. Just proceed on through from that. You see different, it, like th this potentially would be a, an Episcopal church or one of the others. Country churches. Look at the next one that is here. Ah, England. Um, many of the churches of England. Um, the Anglican church or some of the other um, churches strong in England would be lost. But it's not only England. It's also the United States that we see this happening. It's not just the, the gospel being lost in Europe, but also here. And, and notice this one. It's not just Presbyterian and Methodist and various others like that. It's also even Baptist churches when the gospel begins. And, and this sign particularly bothers me a little bit where it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, you know, Revelation 1.8, but I can't keep the church open. I mean, look at the testimony that is there. In our present day, I'm so thankful that many theological new students and many, many of our seminaries are teaching the need to revitalize churches, in part because churches themselves can, can produce a witness that is very poor when the church is abandoned. And it, what it's saying to people as they drive by and they see it, you see, that is from another time. That is passe. We should revitalize churches. We should go after churches in order for the community to know who God is and what God is. Now, obviously, um, when we see churches that have fallen into abandonment and decades of, of being lost, we begin to say, what is the saying? How did this happen? I mean, you imagine these places at one time, especially if they were... Um, certain denominations that, that did have the gospel um, very, very powerfully, but then would begin to fall into a theological disrepair and a theological um, debt that would lead people to go out and buy these churches and then turn them into other uses. Can you imagine living in a former church? Some of them have been turned into bed and breakfasts and all kinds of other things. And you would say, well, that would be beautiful. I mean, some of them are very beautiful structures. But that's all it is, is a building. And, that, and certainly we have been looking at buildings. But these buildings represent congregations of people that have been lost. Can you imagine your bedroom being up on the second floor of an old worship center? That somebody put a floor in and turned it into a house. Not only houses and bed and breakfasts and shops, but also mosques. In England, many, many of the churches from the Welsh Revival, churches that were a part of those things, have been turned into mosques. Um, and this is, and I'm talking about England in some of these cases where um, they did have the gospel. And now the church winds up being abandoned, the church winds up being sold to another um, group of people that do not have the gospel. And we begin to ask, why would this happen? What would bring about, and to go back one, that is in the United States. That is the first all-women mosque of California um, in Los Angeles um, that was a Presbyterian church that was turned into, bought and turned into an all, I mean, I can guarantee you that the Muslims will never use the pipe organ in that building. Um, they don't do that. Um, but we begin to see, how does this happen? Why would this happen? Well, that's what we're going to answer over the next couple of weeks, is how does theological liberalism come in, and how's it, how does it affect us? So take your notes, if you would. We're looking at page 105, and um, I want us to um, come to this and remember this great calling um, that we have to hold on to the gospel and to not let go of the gospel. You see, um, Richard Niebuhr, Niebuhr says this, A God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. So when we look at Richard Niebuhr, a classical liberal theologian, he comes along in his book, Christ and Culture, and he's seeking to rectify and, and, and bring together modern culture with theological beliefs. And he's allowing the modern culture 
to dictate the theological beliefs instead of the theological beliefs dictating the culture. And so when we drift away from the gospel, when we seek to adapt Christianity into the surrounding that is around us, into the culture that is around us, the message begins to be changed because we're not holding on to the true gospel. What is theological liberalism? Um, just notice this, circle the word not in this, in this sentence. So let's first of all talk about what it is not. Liberal views, it is not liberal views on the size of government. We're not talking about liberal governmental things. It's not liberal tax policies. It's, it's not liberal other political issues. This isn't talking about political issues. When we talk about theological liberalism, it has nothing to do with Republicans and Democrats. We're not talking about um, political views or economic views. What we're talking about is theological liberalism, which is a very different thing. Notice this. It is not this that every Christian who disagrees with you about something in the Bible, just because somebody disagrees with you about something in the Bible doesn't mean they're automatically a theological liberal. In fact, they may even be more conservative than you. Um, concerning, they may be more orthodox to you than you. By, by the word orthodox, we mean traditionally held doctrinal beliefs from the New Testament. So it's not necessarily somebody who just disagrees with you. Theological liberalism is not that people who reject Christianity altogether. There are some theological liberals who do hold on to aspects of Christianity or even main tenets of Christianity, but they're struggling with certain things as part of their doctrine. And some of those things um, are very, very critical, and some of them are a little bit less critical. But we want to be uh, very careful to say that theological liberal, liberalism, um, we're not talking about people who reject Christianity altogether. Now, here's what we are talking about when we talk about theological liberalism. People who call themselves Christians yet deny, fill that in, yet deny Scripture and Orthodox Christian teaching on the primary doctrines of Christianity. So these are people who are denying Scripture and, underline those next two words, Orthodox Christian, or those three words, Orthodox Christian teaching. What did we say Orthodox is? Is that the guy with the big black beard and a black robe and a little round black hat? Is that Orthodox? Is that what we're saying by that? You're talking about, when you very often talk about that, you're thinking about Greek Orthodox, right? You're talking about something from Eastern Europe. Orthodoxy does not always mean the Greek Orthodox Church or the Eastern Church. or That, that does tend to be that name. Orthodoxy simply means the the long accepted and held beliefs, the traditional belief that was there, traditional not being in a bad word, but traditional being in a good word, saying that this is what Christians have held. This is Christian orthodoxy. You want to hold on to Christian orthodoxy. You want that. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. We need to understand this terminology here. So, so when we when we talk about uh, polit or excuse me theological liberalism, we're saying that this is where people begin to deny, deny the scripture and they deny Christian beliefs of long standing. Oftentimes, fill this in. Oftentimes, they do this in an attempt to adapt to the changing culture, and so they see all this change in the world, and in fact, accelerated change in recent decades, and so that causes them to say, well, wait a minute, we must have been wrong back on some of the things that we believe, because look at science, or look at other things, look at newer understandings, look at the, look at the way the world has been opened up with information, so we're seeking to adapt to a changing culture. And not only seeking to adapt to a changing culture, but look at this, seeking to appeal to an increasingly non-Christian culture. So as certain cultures around the world, American culture, or some cultures are becoming more Christian right now, other cultures are becoming less Christian right now. And when we see cultures that begin to wane in this, which we would say in Western civilization, we have seen this tendency for quite a long time, where many have been, because of theological liberalism, have been marching away from the biblical truths, then we start to say, oh, well, wait a minute, we have to appeal to the culture 
that is around us. And we're going to talk about this more in a few weeks from now as we talk about what happened with this seeker-sensitive movement that became so powerful in the 1980s and the 1990s that had a devastating effect upon many churches. We want, to, we want to look at that. There were some things there that were probably good, but there were some things there that were, that were probably, excuse me, that were most assuredly were not good as we began to walk away from basic Christian truths. Um, you see, oftentimes, fill this in, oftentimes with language, um, we do this, that appears to be biblical. It appears to be biblical. It appears to have um, some biblical standing or appeal, though it undercuts scripture ultimately. That's what it ultimately does. And it claims to be new and contemporary, new thoughts, new ideas that, that you know, this is something that people haven't really explored before. And this is the, the some would say, the evolution of theology. Let me just tell you that the Bible makes very clear to us that there's nothing new under the sun. The Bible makes very clear to us that we're, we don't need to be looking for new teachings and new theologies. In fact, when you're starting to, to always want something new that you haven't heard before, that is a very dangerous thing to do because invariably we gravitate to the new things that we like. And so if we're looking for things that we like, then we're, then we're starting to talk and we're starting to think about this idea of what the Apostle Paul would say is having our ears tickled. Or the things, that, the things that appeal to us in this. And this is what we see theological liberalism did. Did you see all those for sale churches? Did you see all those empty churches? Did you see the churches converted into bed and breakfast and into homes? This is where it comes from. That there is a gospel that is being traded for the current culture. And this um, is very interesting in that very often it rehashes old heresies. So it comes back to either denying the supernatural works of Christ or denying the supernatural nature of Christ, denying the, um, the uh, explicit claims of the Gospels for exclusivity of, of knowing God and being right with God. And so the, it simply comes along seeking to pull those things away. Here's one of the things that people would say about it. Christianity has to change or it will die. Christianity has to adapt, or it's going to die. So these type of movements of theological liberalism is where that leads. When, the, when theologians begin to um, philosophy and rationalize um, theological truths to the point of without faith, but only with intellect, in diverting from Scripture. So let's, let's just name some, some well-known um, denominations that have struggled with this. The first one that I'm going to name is Baptists. In fact, I'm going to name Southern Baptists. Southern Baptists, though we have a unique denominational um, path, that is unlike all other main denominations, and we'll explain that more in the, couple, in the next couple of weeks, we, we drifted to the left, and then we turned back to the right. And it was a very strange thing. The rest of them drifted to the left and kept going, or split, and part of them turned back to the right, but the, the main group kept going into theological liberalism, a a rationalizing, an adapting, a, an evolving of theology away from that which is true gospel theology. So I just, I want you to notice here, name some of these with me if you would. First of all, I'll, I'll name another one. I've said Baptist, what else? Methodist. So it, it, usually somehow Baptist, you know, Methodist, they immediately come right after it. Methodist also drifted away from the gospel. What else? Who else? Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Anglicans, Lutherans, um, United Church of Christ, which is another group in that they believe in baptismal generation, which is a divergent um, gospel in itself um, in that regard. But um, group after group after group that we could name that were the mainline denominations 
that because of liberal theology, of classical liberal uh, theology, they would leave the basic tenets of the gospel. Um, as I said, Baptists were on the way to do that as well, except for some um, men and women who began to see what was happening in our seminaries and began to see what was being taught to our, our pra- pastors and that which was, was going on. And the alarm started to be sounded. There's some great stories about how that happened. I'm going to share some of those in the next couple of weeks. Um, but eventually the alarm was sounded loud enough that at least the Southern Baptists were able to realize what was happening and turn back to the Bible. So let's, uh, let's look and let's see what are the belief, um, what beliefs characterize theological liberalism. And there's seven main problems that characterize theological liberalism and get us off into the weeds. And I'm going to, they're next to the black dots that are here. And so the number one uh, is down at the bottom of the page. I just want you to put a big one out there to the left of where it says theological liberalism, and then fill this in, rejects the final authority of God's word. Theological liberalism says God's word is not the final authority. Theological liberalism says God's word is not that which dictates what we believe. What are some other things that theological liberalism would say also is authoritative? Say say it again. Tradition, thank you very much. Tradition would be a good one. What else? Culture, you know, certainly the whole culture has to be able to, we have to believe things that the culture can believe, okay, that's probably right. Science, absolutely. Are we, are we, do we see a conflict between Scripture and science? And there, there, there can be this idea that there's all these conflicts. And, and again, what we'll talk about here over the next little bit is that, that as scientificism has come up, there has been this complete misnomer that science and the Bible conflict and are opposed, which is, which is absolutely not true. Um, how about sensationalism? in emotionalism. We move away from clear, logical truth, and we start going into the realm of feelings. The culture moves and moves greater and gr- to a greater and greater extent, not by fact, but more by feelings. And so all of these things come along. So and t- w- this is the idea that it interprets Scripture according to modern, fill this in, modern experiences. Um, and so people would say, well, you know, my modern experience of, of seeing the culture around me and seeing that people don't believe in biblical marriage anymore, so that must mean that we need to change our beliefs upon marriage. Or n- not only upon marriage, but now we're getting into this whole issue of gender. Um, you, you would say, well, it seems pretty obvious the world can't go on um, without male and female in marriage. That seems... That seems pretty basic, but, but now, even in the last two or three years, we've seen this firestorm of questioning of the most basic thing of your gender, um, a, a, a truly radicalization um, of these beliefs, um, and, and then we begin to wonder, even with the basic biology of what somebody is, um, completely antithetical, not only to Scripture, but also also to basic reasoning and, and uh, thought in the, most, in the most fundamental sense. But it also interprets Scripture according to popular reasoning, not logical reasoning. The Bible withstands the logical test because God is ultimately logical. Um, but wait a minute, wait a minute, before you, just I want you to catch this. That idea of modern experience and popular reasoning Popular reason is, what does everybody think? So the idea is, if everybody thinks this, we can't all be wrong, can we? Can, the whole, can, every, can this number of people be wrong? The idea is, if everybody's doing it, it must be okay. Um, my dad used to look at us and say, kids, you need to figure out where everybody's going and head the other direction. <laughs> he really did. He just said, just see where the crowd's going and understand that's probably not the right way. And, and so we, we see that in this as we, 
as we see culture wholesale. And then there's a third one there at the top of the page on page 106. It interprets scripture according to contemporary science. And the idea of, of interpreting everything based upon contemporary science, and even in contemporary science right now, um, there's some things about contemporary science that are very reliable and very true, and there's some things about contemporary science that are simply false, that are completely false. How many times have you heard various things that we believe scientifically that later were proven not to be true? I mean, George Washington, our president, when he needed blood the most, was being bloodlet on the night before he died. They were taking blood out of his system when he needed blood desperately in order to survive. So the science, the best science available in the world, was wrong in that. We see this over and over and over again, not only in the areas of science, but we see it also in the areas of, of even archaeology. Archaeology at one point in the, in, the, um, in the Middle East and in the areas of the Holy Lands, they, they will find one thing and they will think, well, this must mean this. And then they keep digging for a little while longer and they go, oh, we were wrong. Wrong city, wrong time period. Sorry about that. And everybody says, no, it is impossible that Jericho tumbled by the way that it tumbled. That is absolutely impossible. And then they come back. They keep digging. Two decades later, they discover, you know what? The, the thing that this, the Bible says is actually possible. And the biblical scholars who believe the Bible are going, oh, you think? <laughs> I mean, he told us that a long, long time ago. And they're going, oh, no, it would have happened like this. And they begin to say, look at the archaeology. Look at this, how it begins to show. So um, contemporary science can often be wrong. Um, but even when it's right um, and it appears to conflict with Scripture, it doesn't mean that it conflicts with Scripture. But that's exactly what we see happening. Um, with the interpretation of it in modern means. The second big thing, so put a big two next to the next big black bullet point there. It says theological liber liberalism rejects God's supernatural and miraculous work in history. So one of the first things that they do is they throw out the word of God. The second thing that they do is they throw out his supernatural power. So they just say if it can't be rationally explained because of the scientific age, um, of the 1700s going into the 1800s and coming into this modern era, if we can't explain it rationally based upon science, then we, we can't believe in that. And so because they can't imagine an all-powerful God or a God who can come in human form and look at a man and say, get up and walk, and the man gets up and walk, they say, well, that must not have happened. And so they look at the life of Jonah, and they say that that was figurative. He really wasn't in a whale. They look at the life of Joshua, and they say, no, his army really didn't do those things. They look at Moses, and they say, the Red Sea, that's figurative language. It really wasn't like that. It was a, it was a shallow part of the Red Sea. It was because of this and because of that. The ecology and the, uh, the ocean used to be a little bit different. And so they, they actually walk through on muddy ground. It doesn't really mean dry ground. And, and so all of these rationales come through the ages because it can't be supernatural. We're, we're going to throw that out. And so eventually they come to the idea of the resurrection. Well, the resurrection, it, Jesus was crucified on a cross, but he wasn't risen from the dead. The disciples wrote that in in order to recognize. You know, and so this idea of theological liberalism says that if we can't explain it, if it can't be repeated, it can't be true. And so they reject the supernatural and the miraculous work of God in history. So the crossing of the Red Sea is a fill it in a metaphor for gaining freedom from oppressive political systems. So they're running from the Egyptians. The Egyptians are right there about to get them. And the crossing of the Red Sea, you know, they, they said, certain, this is just a metaphor. Look at the next one here. Resurrection of Christ is merely a symbol of hope in the midst of difficult circumstances. And so this is what theological um, liberalism would 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 um, hold on to. Look at number three. Fill this in. Number three. Theological liberalism rejects the seriousness of individual sin before a holy God. What it often does is it just simply, it talks more about it decrying the injustice 
while downplaying evangelism. So we, we, we don't want to really talk about sin. We don't want to really talk about these things. It's much more prone toward holding up a justice, holding up a, a justice in society than saying you need Christ as the salvation of the hope of your life. Um, they would say emphasizing general spirituality over ongoing Philadelphia sanctification. And out to the side of sanctification, right, becoming more like God. So God wants us to become more like him. That we, God wants us to walk with him in his truth and in his way. And so instead of, instead of becoming more like God, the emphasis is to be more spiritual. There are people that have come actually through the roots of gospel Christianity, through theological liberalism, into um, spiritual movements that have nothing to do with biblical religion whatsoever. Um, some of these, this is where we come to the very persuasive, positive self-help people that have a cultic following. And very often they're talking about things that are very, very spiritual. You see them on um, PBS. PBS will have them on for the praise, not the praise a thon, um, for the, uh, whatever, the, 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 you know, raising money for the PBS stations. And there'll be some guy that is there talking, and there'll be hundreds of people listening to him. And he's talking about all kinds of spirituality. Much of it is based in Eastern mysticism and those kinds of things. We've kind of already mentioned that a little bit. Um, in our secret church, but some of those things came right out of what was theological liberalism as they just sought to become more spiritual in nature. Um, look at the next thing, number four. Theological liberalism rejects the Bible's teaching on the person and work of Christ. So they would reject the Bible's teaching on the person and the work of Christ. What do we mean that? They would say this, Jesus, next point there, Jesus is a good moral teacher, but not the divine son of God, not the second person of the Trinity. So theological, theological liberalism would recognize that Jesus existed, most likely, and in most of their tenets, they would say, he did say many of these things, but he was not the son of God. He was not a supernatural savior. He was not from heaven. He, was, he came bringing God's moralism to the world. And the salvation is found in the moral teaching. And so you need, to, you need to adopt, you need to accept, you need to practice his moral teachings in some way, shape, or form that's congruent with the way you feel. And as you do that, you will be able to experience his whole reason for coming. And so it's not about saving the world, laying down his life, and dying on the cross for our sins. So the cross is an example of God's love, but not a propitiation, right below the word propitiation, satisfaction. It's not the satisfaction for God's wrath. And in fact, what we see very clearly in the scripture is that Jesus, what his death was an example but it was more than an example. It was the act that saves us from our sins. If Jesus had not died and if Jesus had not risen from the dead, then we would still be in our sins. But because of that, theological, but because of that, we are, can be free. The theological liberalism would deny the whole thing because it denies, one, the authority of Scripture. Number two, it denies the supernatural. Number three, it denies the idea that you're really sinful and that you really have a problem with the Holy God. Number four, it denies that Jesus is who he said he was and that he came to die on the cross for our sins to satisfy God's wrath. Number five, theological liberalism rejects the Bible's teaching on judgment and eternity. So both of those. The only blank you got to fill in is judgment, but don't miss eternity. Underline eternity. So theological, theological liberalism, is, is it, it completely bypasses the idea that there is a coming judgment. And it, and it certainly does not believe in uh, an eternal state 
in which you may be held accountable for your actions in this life. It downplays or totally denies hell because that is not a popular belief. Many of them would say, well, because you guys talk about hell, that's, because, that's the reason that people don't want to come to church and they don't want to hear what you have to say. You guys are negative. You're talking about hell. If you'd just be positive, they'd come. But when you, you know, somebody comes in from the street and you tell them that they're sinner and without Christ they're going to hell, that's not very encouraging to them. And so, so the reality is, you see, it's, it's what becomes the decider of truth is whether or not it's popular and whether or not it is enjoyable in belief. Um, I, I just, it, it, this is the case in so many, many different areas of, of theology. Look at this. It de-emphasizes the holiness and the wrath of God. So God is not nearly as holy um, as the Scripture says that He's really holy, and God is a much smaller God, and He is not a God that would exact His wrath upon us, um, and be, because that's simply not a popular, popular thing. Now, here's an important note under number five that is not there, but I think is an important statement. Very often, theological liberalism will not come out and say, we deny that this is true. But the way that they practically deny it is this. We simply do not teach those doctrines. We will only teach the grace doctrines. We will only teach the Jesus doctrines of moralism. We will not teach, we just won't talk about hell. We just won't talk about sin. We, won't, we just won't talk about coming judgment. We won't talk about accountability. And so by leaving those things out, they are changing the gospel message. Now, I want to tell you that the book, our study of the book of Hosea has really been um, kicking me on this issue. I have been looking at this and thinking about how little that it is and, and how unpopular it is to look at what God's word really says about his judgment of our sin. It's an unpopular doctrine. It is, and because it's unpopular, listen to this, it's almost unheard of. And when you really talk to the people who are very, what we would say, pragmatic in this, they would say, well, you can do that, but people won't come. Or eventually they won't come. Friends, it's not our job to draw a crowd. It's our job to obey Christ in, a, in building his church. So a train wreck will, grab, will draw a crowd. I mean, horrible things will draw a crowd. A concert will draw a crowd, but when we come down to what is truly building a church, what truly is a true church is a, a group of people that are distinctly Christian, they're distinct from the world, they're not like the world, they're not trying to be like the world, they're not trying to mimic things from the world, but they are seeking to be true in their beliefs and in their faith and in their practice, and so... Um, denial um, sometimes can just simply be by silence. Um, I, I think that this is a good statement. In, in theological liberalism, God is not to be feared, judgment is not to be anticipated, and hell is not to be dreaded. So God is not to be feared. He is to be a nice big fluffy God with a nice big beard floating around on a crowd, cloud and somebody that you know, will only look at you and say, you know, um, come to me, my son, I love you. And there's, there's no, that's okay, don't worry about that. You know, I got it. You know, this, this great big grandpa God mentality. Or judgment is not to be anticipated you know, it's, it's the idea of people don't want to think about that. People don't want to think about one minute after you die, what is going to be the case. Um, the fact that there's a judgment. I mean, 
Hebrews is very clear. It's appointed unto man once to die, and then comes the judgment. Wow. It's coming. And hell should be dreaded. Every single person in this room, as we think about the reality of hell, it should be dreaded. We were talking about this in staff meeting. Um, and this came up a little bit on Sunday sermon. But the judgments that we see against God. And some of y'all help me out here a little bit. As we've been studying Hosea, what are some of the judgments that we see that keep coming out in Hosea? What are the things that God is going to do to the nation of Israel because of their unfaithfulness? Okay, so one of the big ones is they're going to be taken back into captivity. So they're going to, they're going back into captivity. What else? Okay, he's going to reject them. That's one of them. He's, he's, he's going to reject them. He's, what else? Okay, somebody said agriculture. So, so suddenly their crops are not going to, they're not going to work. There's going to be pestilence. There's going to be drought. There's going to be those things. What else? What are other things we've heard? Their offspring, lack of offspring. So they're not going to be prolific. So there are these judgments that we see in the Old Testament that are being played out very painstakingly. I mean, Hosea is for years preaching this. And so we're looking at 13 chapters of judgment, 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 judgment. Saying you've sinned and this is what's going to happen. You've sinned and this is what's going to happen. What's very interesting is when you go to the New Testament, where is the judgment being leveled? What judgment is coming that keeps being talked about in the New Testament? H-E double hockey sticks. Hell is what is being talked about. It, it's, it's not pestilence. It's not all storms. It's not foreign leaders. It's not. Jesus keeps talking about hell. So what, what part of what we see, and it's not that anything changes between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The realities are the same. The, the realities are real um, of, of both. Hell is a, is a very true reality of the Old Testament. But what we see is God is progressively revealing the realities. God is progressively revealing himself. He's progressively revealing our sin. That's showing us his holiness. He's progressively revealing, listen to this, he's progressively revealing his grace. And so the whole story makes sense as you move with the timeline from, from Adam all the way through to Jesus. You see this progressive timeline of us seeing, oh, God is holy. Oh, we are sinful. Oh, there, are, there is a great judgment upon our sin. Oh, we need an escape. We've got to have escape. We've got to have a rescue. And that's it. The whole picture of the Old Testament is pointing to the fact that you've got to have a rescue. You have to have a Savior. Or you're, you're just doomed without the Savior. And then the Savior shows up and everybody's like, wow, it's God himself. You see, most of the people, and we're going to preach through this over the next couple of weeks as we come up on Holy Week, the people were looking for an earthly Messiah. They were looking for a ruler. They were looking for somebody powerful. They were looking for a charismatic person. They were looking for somebody that was going to be able to come and alleviate their pain and throw off the rope of Rome and throw, you know, bring to them this earthly rescue. And what we see in the New Testament is that, that the one showed up and he shows up through a little Jewish girl from northern Israel up in Galilee, and he shows up in poverty, a carpenter's son, showing the real humility of God. And then in all of his majesty, he begins to show his power in his nature and show who he really is. And even over that three-year period of his ministry, again, that whole idea of progressive revelation of who he is, revealing it, showing it, signs, signs to show that he's telling the truth. You remember we looked just, just the other night, or, or the other day, we were looking at the fact that he comes up to the paralytic man, and he says to the par paralytic man, what? What's his first words to the paralytic man? Some of you missed it. Your sins are forgiven. He didn't say rise up and walk. He said your sins are forgiven. So again, we're seeing this progressive realization 
oh, our greatest need is not to walk. Our greatest need is to be saved from our sin. And so theological liberalism is just, it's just ignoring all of that. It's ignoring all about who Jesus really is. It's ignoring all about the judgment and the wrath to come. That's not popular. They don't want to hear that. And so it's ignoring the message of the Bible and doing so in the most nuanced ways, in the most academic ways, in the most rationalistic ways, and ultimately denying that at the highest echelons of academia. Number six there, where it says, theological, theological liberalism rejects certain teachings in Scripture when they become unpopular or ridiculed. So theological liberalism, as soon as the culture around begins to say, oh, that's bad, they go, whoop, we don't believe that. And, and that happens through, through all kinds of things, but we especially see it. It shows up most prevalent in two areas. It shows up in the areas of, of wealth and giving, and it shows up in the areas, listen to this, of sexual morality. Sexual morality, perhaps most. What was not accepted, so, so there, there comes new morals and there comes a revising of what is good and what is right and what is true. And so this is particularly prone um, to discount our, or redefine biblical ethics. And that's what we're really talking about here. Biblical ethics is this idea of what is right and what is wrong based upon Scripture. And so biblical ethics are the things that begin to be adjusted. I mean, it's the idea that, well, is it really wrong to live with someone or is it really wrong to have sex with someone before marriage? Well, you know, and the rationality is, well, everybody does that, so it can't be that wrong. And if it feels so good, how could it be so wrong, right? I mean, there's, there's all of these things that begin to come in, and, and people say, well, no, that's, that really wouldn't be true. I mean, I, we had a young man who was training um, in ministry in France, and um, I'm going to pick on the French a little bit. But we do see this, this mentality in France, even among Christians, that you're just not to tell each other what is right or what is wrong concerning their sexual behavior. Um, and even in the church, I, I knew a young man who was going to seminary, and he was sleeping with his girlfriend on a regular basis. And as we spent a lot of time together, in fact, um, I was really concerned for him, and I, and I was thinking, my friend, you have not been taught what the Bible really says about biblical ethics. And so he and I got in the car, and we drove out to, uh, our pastor had a cabin out in eastern France, and it was a beautiful place. And we just went out there to spend a couple of days with the Lord and together. And I was, I was seeking to help him see this. And as I showed him in the Bible all of the places where it talks about the fact that fornication is against the heart of God, the purity of the marriage bed is very important to God. God wants us to have a, a righteousness within our sexuality that denies the flesh and honors what is true and good and right and holy and just. And as I did that with this young man, he, it, it was his life. He was like, why didn't anybody ever tell me this? When he went home and told his girlfriend, uh, we can't sleep together anymore. I mean, she was so mad. I mean, she did not understand. I mean, there was a lot of anger. And it was a foreign idea. Now, part of the problem was theological liberalism is rampant in Europe. There's not a lot of fundamental belief of biblical values and truth there. So here we were in about the most conservative church we could find in eastern France, and ministry students, their, their biblical ethics, in part because of the popular culture around them in Europe, was so very permissive and so very, let me say, promiscuous, which means not pure, not holy, doing what we want to do in our flesh against the heart of God. Um, so these things are um, unpopular and they're ridiculed 
and then theological liberalism will abandon them when they come to them. Um, look at the um, last one that is here at the bottom of page 106. Theological liber liberalism rejects consistent teachings from the church throughout history. Things that have been long held and understood that are biblical and consistent, they come to reject those for something that's new. Look at the top of page 107. The claims to have progressed in knowledge and understanding. You know, well, we used to believe that, but now we've grown past that. You know, we, we believe in um, a higher understanding of these things. It implies at least, fill it in, ignorance, if not foolishness, in Christians who have come before us. So the idea is, is that the Christians who used to believe that, well, they didn't know everything we know. And in fact, theological liberalism will look at those who hold on to the fundamentals of the gospel, hold on to the fundamentals of the faith, and they will say, oh, yeah, I understand. We won't, we won't correct them because they just don't understand yet. They haven't, they haven't evolved theologically yet to understand where we really are. So um, the key things that we, we just, just kind of look at your notes there, 105, the first thing that they reject is God's word. This is so very important. First thing is they reject is God's word. 106, they reject the supernatural altogether. So that number two, they reject the supernatural. Number three, they reject sin, the real idea of sin before a holy God. You're not really guilty. It's really not that bad. Number four, they reject the claims of who Christ really is and what he really did. Number five, they reject theological, um, excuse me, the judgment and the eternity reality that is coming. You know, there's not really those realities. Anything, number six, anything that's unpopular or ridiculed, we're not going to really hold on to that. And 2,000 years of church history that held on to these theological beliefs, we know better than 2,000 years, 20 um, decades, excuse, excuse me, 20 centuries of Christians who went before us. Now, friends, that's how Joseph Smith wound up in big trouble, the leader of Mormonism. That is how the leaders of Jehovah's Witnesses, that is how the leaders of various other movements along the way, some of which we've studied, they went against 2,000 years of biblical truth. Whenever we start to see that happening, we need to run the other direction. We need to un understand that the Bible is where we hold our doctrine and where we hold our truth, not in the culture that is around us, not in what is popular. So as we continue in this, we're going we're gonna to be looking more at how should we respond to theological liberalism. And then um, Stephen and I have been meeting, Stephen Coffin and I have been meeting about some areas that we're going to look at both in Judaism and in Islam and in other areas where we see mission work to Jews, mission work to Muslims, mission work to Hindus, where we start to compromise the gospel. Now, that won't be part of theological liberalism. We've got another week on theological liberalism that we'll deal with that. But then when we start to look at other religions around us and how we share the gospel with them, people very often, in order desiring to make the gospel more palatable to them, they will change the message. And in changing the message, they lose the power um, of it. And you can have a human-manufactured movement that is not a spirit-manufactured movement that brings great deception and great harm. So any questions about what we've looked at tonight? Any thoughts about what we've looked at? We've got a minute or two here tonight. Any thoughts about this? Ms. Fang? Yeah. 
Yeah. I have to. Yeah. Right. So going back to the young man that didn't quite understand um, the issues of, of biblical purity, yeah. um, first of all, our flesh is powerful and it'll deceive us and make us, you know, we, when we want what we want, we want it to be right. Okay. Um, that, that's part of it. But it's, it's also true that as we begin to learn and, and hear what is right and what is wrong before God, that the Holy Spirit convicts us. And the people who respond to his conviction and respond to the grace of his love can come to see this is truly wrong. Now, I mean, how many times have, have maybe any of you, even as Christians, held on to a sin trying to defend it for a while? And you had a friend that kept saying, no. I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of what we see there is, well, I was perhaps defending this and then I came to see Oh, I'm wrong. We see that in the conflict between Peter and Paul. Um, we see that in the issues um, that were going on in the New Testament, that there were certain things that, that either because of fear of man or um, various other things that, that people had to be corrected. Um, but yeah. Any other thoughts on this drift of theological liberalism and seeing the, the change of through the decades? Any thoughts or questions on that? Any other comments? Yeah. Real loud. Right. Well, there's that's a that's a broad answer, but classical liberalism really began in the philosophical realms in the mid 1800s, and even back to the late 1700s through the rationalism of Europe that began to make its way into theological circles. And so it typically, whatever happens in philosophy and in religious philosophy, it takes a couple of generations before it starts to make it to um, the apply, being applied on the street. So if you want to know today um, what is going to happen in 20 or 30 years from now, Go look and see what philosophers and what, what is being philosophized about within the philosophical realm. Eventually that makes it into the classrooms and those classrooms eventually make it into the street. And that's, that would be true with education in general, but that's certainly true within theological things as well. So in seminary, they're starting to hear all about Darwinianism and evolution and everything else and they're trying to, they're trying to rectify that they're trying to reconcile that with Genesis 1 and 2 and they're starting to see one as a fairy tale and the other one as scientific fact and then eventually and, and so we're going to talk about some of you are going you yeah, know those are good questions well our bookstore is full of very rational understandings of of how Genesis 1 and 2 can be completely true and and not be false whatsoever and yet um also, we see the scientific world around us, um, how evolutionism can be completely wrong um, in, the, in the inference that we were once monkeys um, and that we came out of a mud puddle. Um, so um, there's, you know, there's, there's vast amounts in that. But yes, generations would be by, going by. Classical liberalism um, was very, very popular in the 1910s, 20s, 30s in the seminaries. Um, by the time I got to seminary, I couldn't go to a good Southern Baptist seminary that wasn't filled with classical liberalism, so I went to another seminary. Um, there, were, there were all kinds of things that were being taught at most of our Southern Baptist seminaries that were not, that were, that were questionable. And so over a period of time, that was turned back. Um, but that's a, that's a good question. Other comments or questions about that? Y'all okay? This is important. This is really important because you see what's happened in our society. Kind of roll back through a few of those pictures, Michael. I mean, just you see that what was the grand edifice um, very often that would, that would reveal a passionate, powerful faith. And not that buildings do that in itself. You can have a great big building and have very, very wrong beliefs. But it does represent, at a time, 
uh, the gospel being preached, and then eventually when you take away the supernatural, when you take away judgment, when you take away a holy God, when you take away um, a message that has eternal consequences, well, let's just go to the beach. I mean, why, why do all this if none of that's true? Theological liberalism came to the point where they got, would have conferences from the 70s, 80s, and 90s that they would just get together and talk about everything they didn't believe as opposed to talk about what they do believe. I praise the Lord that there has been a resurgence of biblical theology. That I mean, you guys have seen the pictures of all of us going to tell, together for the gospel and going to various other conferences, the Gospel Coalition and other groups that are saying, no, we are holding on to the gospel. Um, I praise God that that has happened um, as opposed to there being none of that. But it's very interesting, the theological... Um, the theological conferences around liberalism are very, very small. Because what are you going to do? Get together and talk about everything you don't believe? I mean, that's ultimately what they're doing. Any other thoughts? Yes. Yeah. Right, right. And the guy in your backyard is the guy that we're going to talk about in three weeks. So after Easter, we're going to talk about the guy that came from Chicago. Right. So we're going to talk about the seeker-sensitive movement and how megachurches, um, were, and not all megachurches. There are megachurches that are very, very faithful to the gospel. Um, but we're going to see how there were many, many megachurches, and we see you know, big crowd Christianity as opposed to church Christianity and individualization, um, the, the whole non-relational Christianity that becomes much more of a consumer-driven Christianity um, that we see has been detrimental um, to the church. And it's very interesting, megachurches tend right now, I mean, there's, there's noted uh, exceptions to this, but in general, the megachurch movement is imploding. They are they are not continuing. Some are. There's noted, noted exceptions to that. But in general, the 1980s and the 1990s, when we saw the explosion of megachurches, that has not continued at all. And it has to do with the gospel that's being preached.